bone might have leukemia with that. Does anybody know the difference between like leukemia and lymphoma? <laughs> So these are terms that have to do with their clinical presentation. And we'll flesh out leukemia and lymphoma. We'll probably learn about five per day if they're white by the answers. What about diseases of the spleen? Do we know any diseases of the spleen? That's a trickier question. But the spleen generally does respond to all disease states the same way. And that's high enlarging. I've explained my belief. Anybody know any diseases of the thymus? You leave the microphone. So we're really only going to touch on one thing. We're going to touch on thymoma, which is a tumor, a nice tumor of the thymus. Uh, just for the sake of remembering that the thymus is this. There is an autoimmune disease with which, for which the thymus plays an important role in being an autoimmune disease. Maybe somebody has a brand new My semiographics, have you heard of my semiographics? Well, we'll hear about it soon enough, and a lot of these patients are treated by having their thymus removed. I don't know, there was a, there was a, a request in the last lecture for the table contents. I think that is a good request, and all of our spring lectures come with table contents. What I did instead, I'm going to try to do two birds with one cell, and I'll try to do this uh, for all of the lectures. The material that we're covering, this isn't like material I'm discussing, but this is very standard material to this part. There's a very good textbook, Pathologic Waste and Neurologic Defense. It is this textbook, I believe it's the fifth or sixth chapter, that we use when we put the neoplasia in the textbooks. And as we are talking through the use of the organ systems, we are going through different chapters of this textbook. So today's lecture is from chapter 13, and I've written the pages here. This chapter does begin with an outline of the table of contents, and something of an overview of the conditions that we will be covering today. I would actually encourage you all, I know it's like so 1900, but I would encourage you all actually to download the textbook, get it on a PDF, you know, put it on your computer, put it on a thumb drive, and it really is worth keeping. You know, between having lots and lots of details on different conditions, and also having a very useful word search feature, right? You can right click and then find and put in a word. And then you can really help yourself out in terms of looking things up and learning. So I would actually encourage you, I'll leave it to, even to read the computer say that. I know I never did. But I want you all to be better than me. So we're going to talk about diseases of the white blood cells first. And we are going to uh, very quickly remind ourselves that the hematopoietic system exists. The hematopoietic system is a system that is designed to produce blood. Mostly the core of the elements of the blood, the extracellular matrix, is what percent of water? Yeah, 90 plus, 97% water. You don't need the bone marrow to produce water, we know where to get water from. It's a system because there's different organs that are involved in the production and in the maturation of the core elements of the blood. Somewhat arbitrarily, we divide the hematopoietic system, and specifically the organs that are involved in the production of the blood, into myeloid tissues and lymphoid tissues. The myeloid tissues, as I've written here, are the bone marrow, and then all the cells that are derived from the bone, from the bone marrow. The lymphoid tissues are the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the thymus. I kind of in parentheses say that it's an arbitrary classification. Can we, can we think of at least one reason why this classification might be arbitrary? So lymphocytes would correspond to which of these two? Lymphocytes, right? So those would be associated with myeloid tissues or lymphoid tissues? Yeah, we need to sort of guess that, right? Without the conception of myeloid. Where do lymphocytes come from? Where do baby lymphocytes come from? Yeah, the bone marrow. That's what the B stands for in T cells. What does the T stand for? Thymus. Yeah, so it's something of an arbitrary classification. But it's helpful for understanding certain disease states. And when we get to cancer of the white blood cells, we're going to break them down into myeloid neoplasms and lymphoid neoplasms. We're actually not going to break them into the of the components. It's very important to understand the role of the stem cells, the role of stem cells in general. 
all tissues rely heavily on precursor cells or on progenitor cells. This is the small population of cells that actually populates the entire organ from which it comes. And so, hematopoietic stem cells are important. And when we do a bone marrow transplant, it is to these cells that we are transplanting. If somebody has sickle cell anemia, it is because a stem cell at the very top, or the early progenitor cell that is responsible for making red blood cells, it is because it has that mutation in hemoglobin B. So the only way to erase, so to speak, and to get rid of that disease to cure a patient would be somehow to replace this whole system with a system that doesn't have that genetic mutation. And you do so by blasting one's existing bone marrow with chemotherapy and radiation therapy, basically putting heavy weaponry and artillery towards it, eliminating all those stem cells, and then when a person's at their nadir, and if they have no stem cells, then you engraft someone else's bone marrow. You call that a bone marrow transplant, or a HSCT, and not a quite stem cell transplant. We know formed elements of the blood, I'm gonna read through those, and I think it's just important to remember, particularly for this organ system, that a stem cell itself is not responsible for producing all the formed elements of the blood. It's like administration, it's like bureaucracy. Like every, every important person has like a few people underneath them to actually do the work for them. And then you want to find out what that person does, it turns out that they have people underneath them. You're like, who actually does any work? And then. So, hematopoiesis, as a reminder, occurs differently in different ages. There's fetal, infant, and adult hematopoiesis. By the way, the room in this darkness is okay with me. Is it okay with you all? Yeah. I also have no idea how to turn the lights on. So. <laughs> <laughs> embryogenesis begins during the third month of. Oh, I'm sorry, embryogenesis. <coughs> hematopoiesis begins during the third month of embryogenesis. And this begins in the liver. So, hematopoietic stem cells migrate to the liver. And this is where hematopoiesis occurs until some are not birth. If we think back to some of our previous lectures, the liver can get abnormally large during certain anemic states. What do we call that when the liver is abnormally large? Hepatomegaly. Can read the list. No, it's not the speed now, please. Hepatomegaly. That is good. Yeah, the liver, just like the spleen, for example, are able to awaken these desires and these abilities from early on to produce uh, bone marrow. Hematopoietic stem cells also reside in the fetal placenta. We don't actually know why in terms of a functional contribution, but this is particularly useful in terms of harvesting hematopoietic stem cells that can be used for therapeutic purposes for other individuals. Hematopoietic stem cells also begin to migrate to the bone marrow during embryogenesis. And by the time an individual is born, the marrow throughout the skeleton is active in a hematopoietic sense. After puberty, we restrict hematopoiesis to the axial skeleton. I've got a little image here. The bones in blue are the axial bones. What are the bones in white? <laughs> Appendicular, yes, the axial <coughs> When I say that after puberty, hematopoiesis is restricted to the axial skeleton, you can know which bones are pink. This is bone marrow. We've seen a picture. We're not going to talk through histology. This is a little bit of a cartoon version. We have some idea of how the hematopoietic cell system, the stem cell system, works. And there are growth factors that act on progenitor cells, committed lineage specific progenitor cells. There's no growth factor that acts on the stem cell itself. These growth factors are the basis for short term response to physiologic needs. We've seen similar charts like this before. Uh, with this kind of a chart, I think it's very important to remember the platelets. We talked about that already. I mean, other things are less important than you can remember, but we definitely know what's a normal platelet count and what's an abnormal platelet count. There are many different conditions that can alter production of blood cells. We've already been learning about some of them. Practically speaking, white blood cells are the cells that fluctuate most in terms of their concentration. A lot of common things such as infection 
account for increased body fat. There are other reasons as well, toxins, nutritional deficiencies. What might be a nutritional deficiency that will affect white blood cell production? Why would it be iron? Although we have learned a lot of iron in the Why is it just red? Yeah, because iron is important to the chemicals. There's no chemicals in white blood What are some other nutritional deficiencies that we learned about last week that could apply to the to white blood cells? What are some other anemia to learn about? We learned about iron deficiency anemia. We learned about what other deficiency anemia. Vitamin B12 deficiency anemia. And what else? Folate. Yeah. So folate and vitamin B12 deficiency are examples of deficiencies that can result in glucose. And then tumors, of course. Yes, if you're growing in your bone marrow, or if you have some kind of tumor that's affecting normal hematopoiesis, that can result in. When we talk about problems or diseases with the white blood cells, we generally classify them into leukopenias or leukocytosis. And this depends on whether there's a relative deficiency or if there's an overproduction of white blood cells. Let's first talk about neutropenia. Neutropenia being a deficiency in circulating neutrophils. We should know this number, 1500, or some number of should. You really shouldn't have to go back to a book to find out what is a bad absolute discount, even though I can see that you will not be looking at that laboratory value on a regular basis. That is definitely something in terms of normal basic health that you want to know, so that you know maybe what's an average weight, an average height, an average BMI, you may know what you need to know without this either in your office. Neutropenia is an absolute neutral count that's below 1500. Neutropenia is the most common cause of neutropenia. Neutrophils are the most prevalent in the sites in the blood. Neutropenia usually a result of the susceptibility to bacterial and fungal infections. This should make sense when you think about the function of neutrophils as a first responder to the disease infection. It also shouldn't be a stretch to understand that the oral cavity is a common location for infection. We have hundreds of commensal bacteria that reside in our mouth. And we can perhaps think about other organ systems that might be involved in the state of, in the state of neutropenia. Perhaps the skin, perhaps the upper respiratory tract, maybe even the lungs. It can begin to make sense. We can probably begin to think of uh, anatomic sites where infection can occur. There can also be constitutional signs and symptoms, but constitutional signs constitutional symptoms are referred to malaise, cheese, uh, chills, and fever. Neutropenia usually occurs as a result of drugs. What drugs cause neutropenia? Chemotherapy. Chemotherapy. The answer is very prevalent in this time. Many individuals are <laughs> Drug-induced neutropenia is the most common cause of neutropenia, and that's because many individuals are on chemotherapy. Neutropenia can occur for other reasons as well, as we talked about. And I want you all to be aware of the fact that there exists benign ethnic neutropenia. Benign because their clinical course is entirely asymptomatic and ambulant. Ethnic because it's a condition that seems to affect African Americans or individuals with African descent. In neutropenia, we know what the word neutropenia means. Benign ethnic neutropenia refers to an absolute neutral count that is low, it's below 1500, and it should cause disease, but in these individuals, there's no disease. These individuals are entirely asymptomatic and more importantly, they're physiologically healthy and functional. Benign ethnic neutropenia. Another neutropenia that is a word being aware of, uh, certainly for boards, uh, although I wouldn't say it's particularly common or relevant from a clinical standpoint, is something that's known as cyclic neutropenia. So again, if you could write the name of this disease out without any sort of a problem, just by a blank piece of paper, if you can know that this disease exists, you're already like three quarters of the way of knowing most of the things about the disease. Everything else is nice and common and common. Cyclic neutropenia is exactly what it sounds like. It is a six to eight week course whereby if one blood values are assessed frequently, like every two or three days, you can 
see over the course of those six to eight weeks, you can appreciate a couple of cyclical nadir with the white blood cell count. Over a period of 21 days, so you'll capture at least two of those one, not you, you won't put the blood. But the physician is working with the patient over the course of the six to eight week period, they will capture at least two of these six courses of neutropenia. And within a cycle of about 21 days, there's a period of three to five days where there's a very, very low neutrophil count. And during those few days when the neutrophil count is very low, an individual may manifest a variety of infections. Infections such as a low-grade fever or a variety of oral or pharyngeal infections. Periodontal disease has to come as no surprise. Periodontitis is caused by that These individuals usually are managed supportively and they grow out of this condition. Individuals improve <laughs> Antibiotic therapy may be needed, perhaps even in a prophylactic sense, and as you can imagine, preventative care is very important. If you ever have a patient with this condition, you will tell them that this condition exists and what it means in terms of their death and health, and then they should be on board with you in terms of preventative care. These individuals can be treated with GCSF, as you can remember now what it means here But it is a factor, it's a growth factor that stimulates granulocytes. I have two bills are granulocytes. Can we name some other granulocytes in the blood? PSNFLs, ASNFLs. Now let's go to the segue to this term called agranulocytosis. So agranulocytosis is basically really, really extreme in your future. It is more or less a functional absence of circulating in the blood. From a laboratory standpoint, you can have an absolute neutrophil count. So you're allowed to have 100 neutrophils in your body and still uh, not have really any significant neutrophil response. But that's a great You can guess the clinical symptoms of these individuals, I hope, namely, they have very marked susceptibility to infection. These individuals are at risk for death. They really, really need the period of the most common cause of agranulocytosis is chemotherapy. It is what we do from a healthcare standpoint to try to cure our patients of disease. There are other medications that can result in agranulocytosis as well. Practically speaking, what happens, and maybe we learned about this in the later course last fall, but we will bombard our individuals with chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and it will frequently be beyond the point of no return, but at the same point, we're also giving them GCSF so that at least their reproduction by blood cells that we really attempt to bombard bone marrow and get rid of all of these stem cells, get rid of whatever it is. So, those are the results. Basically, neutropenia being the important disease. Lymphocytes uh, originally arise from the bone marrow and then they're educated to the bone marrow over time. Basis for referring to them as B cells or T cells. We know about lymphocytes and whole region around the wrist and spine and you all. We also have learned about lymph nodes. I'm sure Dr. Handler has drawn something and now we're experts on lymph nodes. And this is just a little bit of a reminder for you all. Probably the most clinically uh, frequently encountered uh, condition of lymph nodes is lymphadenitis, which simply means inflammation of the lymph. Lymphadenitis is common. You will identify lymphadenitis in maybe 15 or 25% of your patients when you do your routine 60 or 90 second head and neck scan required to do patient work. You will frequently identify it. It's not going to look anything like that, but the picture to get your attention. But that is an enlarged lymph node. Does anybody know what lymph node is enlarged there? Not a retro original problem. So I'm going to do a little bit forward. What are these lymph nodes called? Yeah, this is cervical. This is cervical. The most common lymph nodes that are affected by lymphadenitis are those in the cervical region, region both the axillary and inguinal regions, and mesenteric regions. Lymph nodes that are inflamed or enlarged in our part of the body, right on the cervical, is usually due to a dental infection or a tonsil infection. 
And so frequently when you palpate somebody and, and they have a slightly pendulous nose, you'll ask them if they have been sick recently. And they go, yeah, I have. And you yawn because you're tired of In terms of lymphadenitis, lymphadenitis, from a clinically, I would say, relevant standpoint, it can either be acute and nonspecific or chronic and nonspecific. By nonspecific, I mean that you palpating the lymph node and asking a patient one or two triage questions to make sure that there's not something that requires an immediate workup. Some requires to the fact you going through that process is not diagnostic. Like, you're not going to end up diagnosing the patient. Acute nonspecific lymphadenitis is but let me know with chronic lymphadenitis, because so that is by far a little more common name. Chronic lymphadenitis, chronic non-specific lymphadenitis, is a slightly enlarged lymph node. And it's slightly enlarged to the point where it's palpable. Can you normally palpate lymph nodes? No. You can't normally palpate lymph nodes. So if you are able to palpate a lymph node, then it is enlarged. If you're able to palpate a lymph node, then it is enlarged. If you palpate a lymph node and it is freely movable and it's not very firm at all, it kind of has its normal sort of balloon consistency or something like that, and it's not painful, that is chronic non specific lymphadenitis. I have a couple of those lymph nodes and probably many of us do as well. You were just sick once upon a time, you know, when you were a kid or maybe more recently, your lymph node enlarged. We'll talk about acute non specific lymphadenitis in a second. And then it regressed back in size, but it completely cell. It remained a little bit large because of probably some fibrotic scar. And for the rest of your life, there's a lymph node that can be healthy. Chronic, not specific When you help with a lymph node in your patient, you are now going to identify the particular event that happened at seven years of age. Acute, not specific lymphadenitis is basically the response of the lymph node to infection. And by response, I guess what I mean is this clinical presentation that you will elicit from a patient. Lymph nodes are enlarged, not at all to the size of the previous slide, but by large, it simply means you can help it again. Most of them are a centimeter or less. And so when you're writing to your note in the dental chart, you're just going to say sub-centimeter. It's who has time to measure And it doesn't matter. They'll be a little bit tender. That's the important discriminating finding between the two. Tender versus non tender. They'll be somewhat fluctuant, but so is chronic uh, lymphadenitis. Overlying skin may be red, and there's a few other, a few other things you can think about here. So let's talk about probably the most important category of disease uh, when it comes to white blood cells, and I think the most important category of disease uh, in today's lecture this morning. And these are neoplastic proliferations of white blood cells. There's really three broad categories of this disease. There's lymphoid neoplasms, myeloid neoplasms, and histiocytosis. Histiocytosis being malignancies of blood cell type. Any guess? Histiocytes. Histiocytes are a full word or a Dr. Cancer age work for blood cell. Okay, we'll get there. Okay, nice. Lymphoid neoplasms, myeloid neoplasms, and dyspiocytosis. Remember, we broke down the immune, we broke down the hematopoietic sex system into lymphoid tissue and myeloid tissue. We do not categorize white blood cells as lymphoma or leukemia. Although those are very commonly used terms, and I'll explain why they're common and what exactly they mean. <clears throat> what are risk factors for neoplasm in the white blood cells? So this would be the basically say genetics. And it kind of makes sense. When you think about white blood cells, when you think about B lymphocytes, for example, and B lymphocytes, many of them want to grow up to become plasma cells. And they go through this process of somatic hypermutation. Remember? Somatic hypermutation. Have we learned about that? Somatic hypermutation? Have we learned about somatic hypermutation? If we haven't, I don't know. Don't go through the tail. We should probably go over it. Those mutation all over the body. Okay, so somatic hypermutation, maybe, is there like immunology or? or, or are there immunology courses in second year? I'm sure we about somatic hypermutation. But very, very quickly, somatic hypermutation is the process that occurs to B cells 
after they are exposed to an antigen. So let's say a B cell is exposed to an antigen. Then that B cell or progeny will clonally expand. By that I mean the B cell will give rise to many, many offsprings. Offspring B cells. All of them want to be plasma cells of that girl. The component of the genome that is responsible for producing antibodies, that component is highly mutagenic and for normal physiologic reasons. It's highly mutagenic. And so as the plasma, as the B cell is giving off all of its progeny, this part of the genome is unstable and it is different in all of its offspring. What that means functionally is that all of these B cells that arise from the same mama B cell, they all have slightly different antibodies with slightly different affinities for whatever the target antigen is. So all of this progeny, only the one that has the highest affinity for an antigen survives and becomes a plasma cell. And it's that B cell that then gives rise to the whole army or clone of B cells that goes after infection. That's why if you have memory B cells, you're going to not be as sick the second time around, right? This is the basis of vaccination, and so on and so forth. But somatic mutation includes the word mutation. And we learned all about mutations last week, last fall. And so just like mutations can occur in this physiologically very important region of the genome for creating a targeted immune response, you can imagine how a mutation might accidentally happen in some very important genes that play roles in cell stability. Can we remember any genes that are frequently mutated in neoplasia? So some genes like QC53 or RAS and a few others, just to name a few. We definitely don't need to know those genes for this kind of lecture. But hypermutation or mutation of any sort can occur in those genomic regions during this physiologic period when hypermutation is occurring, and then that's a problem. So genetics is really the main reason why uh, why white blood cells give rise to neoplasm. There can be inherited genetic factors. There can also be viral infections. Why might viral infections be associated with white blood cell cancers? This process of somatic hypermutation of responding to an antigen, do you think that occurs more frequently or less frequently in the context of an infection? No. Yeah, more frequently. You can perhaps understand how an infection of some sort, usually a viral infection, results in uh, increase of white blood cell cancers. <clears throat> we'll talk first about lymphoid neoplasms. Lymphoid neoplasms are usually B cell neoplasms, and they are used, and they are sometimes T cell neoplasms. Very rarely they're NK cell neoplasms. We'll learn about NK T cell lymphoma simply because that occurs in the nasal region. So it's kind of important. What kinds of lymphoma do we know about? Can we name a lymphoma? There's Hodgkin lymphoma, what else? So there's Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin. So we'll explain Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin either at the end of the cell or at the beginning of the second cell. And what on earth those terms actually mean? Just like B cells and T cells have a normal pathway to physiologic development, so many of the white blood cell cancers including those we'll learn about, they mimic some particular stage of lymphocyte development. The information on this slide doesn't have to memory, but it certainly is, if you do know your normal physiology, it certainly is an easier way to keep some of these diseases in track, in mind. For example, multiple myeloma is also known as plasma myeloma, you remember that there exists a marginal zone around dermal centers, and it might be easier to remember that there's such a thing as a marginal zone from bone. So let's explain these terms leukemia and lymphoma. Leukemias and lymphomas are descriptive terms, they're not diagnostic terminology. They're descriptive terms, but they're very useful descriptive terms. If someone has a leukemia or if someone has a lymphoma, that says something about the clinical presentation of their lymphoma. Leukemias and lymphoid neoplasms that are liquid. These are liquid cancers, and they are floating around the bone marrow and the peripheral blood. You can draw someone's blood and realize that they need to have a leukemia. 
Lymphomas are lymphoid neoplasms that present as discrete masses. Where do you think the lymphoma is going to most likely occur? In what organ? The thymus is a reasonable guess because it's part of the hematopoietic system. What might be an even better guess for a lymphoma? A lymph node. About two thirds of lymphomas occur in lymph nodes, and the remainder are extra nodes. Our concept of dividing these diseases by clinical presentation is somewhat artificial because lymphomas can have leukemia presentation. That is, at some point, this lymphoid neoplasm stops being a mass and it just is progressed to the stage where it's also a liquid cancer. And the opposite is true, the same is true for leukemias. Leukemias can sometimes present as discrete masses, and that can even sometimes be the initial clinical presentation. So if we call a disease a particular type of lymphoma, an autoimmune lymphoma, that simply says something about how the disease usually presents. So autoimmune lymphoma usually presents as a discrete mass. Even before we learn about the disease, we'll take a two-thirds guess that this is a mass that affects lymphomas. We can think a little bit about the clinical presentation of the prevention complaint. If you have a Goomba growing in your lymph node or somewhere else in your body, there may be symptoms that are related to mass effect, right? Simply the effect of the mass compressing the esophagus and whatever it may be. Leukemias will affect hematopoiesis adverse, and so there can be signs and symptoms related to anemia, thrombocytopenia, or leukopenia. Multiple myeloma, a particular kind of cancer, affects the skeleton, and you can even guess that by the name. You can put many to multiple myeloma. So myeloma, maybe there are a bunch of omas that are affecting the myeloma region, right, the bone marrow region. And there's multiple of them throughout the skeleton. And so we can even now begin to think of some of the clinical presentation to get the slides to the number. How do lymphoid neoplasms typically present? I know we're sort of having a lot of introductory slides, but these are concepts that are worth knowing. Most individuals with lymphomas experience what are known as B symptoms. B symptoms. The B symptoms are fever, night sweats, and unexplained weight loss over a six month period or so. All malignancies can metastasize, and you can maybe even guess somehow how malignancies from the hematopoietic system are particularly prone to metastasize because the hematopoietic system uh, is responsible for certain forces. And so lymphomas, even these tumors that present in these three masses, they frequently spread out and spill out into the peripheral blood early in disease course. We have a particular way of staging lymphomas, one through four, based on the extent of disease. We also want to know whether or not these symptoms are present and whether or not extranodal sites are involved. Considering the early propensity for cancer spread, what treatment modality is almost always used in lymphomas? And this will be the same treatment modality that we see in leukemias. If you have cancer circulating all through your bloodstream, what are our three treatment modalities for cancer? Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgical therapy, right? Is surgical therapy going to work if your cancer is floating around the bloodstream? What about radiation therapy? Yeah, we can do better than try something whole body, although we do that for 95%. So chemotherapy is an essential mechanism of cancer treatment for these patients. So let's talk about our first lymphoid neoplasm. And our first one is helpful for underscoring the point that I've elaborated already. This is even called acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and it's also known as acute lymphoblastic lymphoma. What do you think that means about the disease presentation? It simply means that this lymphoid neoplasm is just as likely to present as a goomba somewhere as it is to present as a liquid cancer that is all throughout the bone marrow and the peripheral blood. So that's why it has to be the one that Fortunately, leukemia and lymphoma are in the same bladder, so you can just abbreviate this uh, as ALL. This is the most common cancer of children. I think it affects about, not affects, but I think it accounts for about a third or a fourth of all the average cancers. So if you see a commercial on TV for St. Jude's Hospital or some other institution like that, and you see children who die of any care because of what treatment? 
<laughs> of course, you don't know what cancer this child has, and you can only play the percentage game. But a highlight for those at least one of these children in the commercial that you're looking at has passed ALL. Most cases occur at an early age or age 15. If symptoms are typically rapidly appearing, they have to do with the leukemic presentation of this tumor. Humans of blastic leukemias have something of a predilection for meningeal spread. And so this can result in headaches or vomiting and even nerve pulses. Fortunately, this leukemia is treatable, and many children, 95% of their care, achieve remission with aggressive chemotherapy. 75 to 85 percent of children are cured. What's the difference? Why do I have these two different bullet points and why are the percentages not the same? That is correct. So remission is not the same as cure. We know what cure is, so what is remission? I'm sorry? It can reoccur. Permission can reoccur. So what is remission if a reoccurrence can? Perhaps your biometric screening would indicate that there's something there that you might see some of the symptoms from it. So we're tracking in the right direction. There's definitely the absence of signs and symptoms. But if we can detect the presence of cancer in one body, either through imaging modalities or from laboratory tests, and they are not in remission. Or maybe they are in remission, but they have not achieved remission. What remission refers to is the absence of cancer, either by imaging or by laboratory testing. But you can still have minimal amounts of cancer that are present in you that are at too low an extent to be identified by laboratory testing. So how do you know if someone's in remission or cured? It's just you don't. You don't, and that's why you hear so many stories about, oh, well, I thought I was cured of my cancer, and then 15 years later, this, this lymph node metastasis showed up. That lymph node metastasis was always there, but it was present in the micro metastasis. And it took 15 years for that micro metastasis flourished into and it blossomed into a large metastasis that is now clinically significant and maybe even the cause of the patient's death. Yeah. That's one of the problems, one of the challenges with cancer therapy. Next cancer we'll learn about is chronic lymphocytic leukemia or small lymphocytic lymphoma. Again, it can either be leukemia or lymphoma in terms of its clinical presentation. But this is the same disease. The, the scatter plots on the right, this is a process that's not as close to so treats a way of diagnosing leukemias, and you don't need to know any more than that. CLL, let's just refer to the CLL. CLL is the most common leukemia of adults in the Western world. Are you going to see it particularly frequently? You're not going to see it all as frequently as you see dental care. So do you practice in the Western world? Yes. Will you be treating well? No. Yes. CLL is the most common leukemia of adults in the Western world. CLL is usually a disease of elderly. So ALL is a pediatric condition. CLL is usually a disease of elderly. And CLL has an invalid clinical course. Most individuals will die with the disease, and they will not die of the disease. This disease is treated with palliative chemotherapy. It's treated with palliative chemotherapy. What is palliative chemotherapy? Yeah, it's sort of designed to address the symptoms. It is not aggressive. It's not designed to cure the patient. There's an interesting paradox in leukemias and lymphomas in that really aggressive, life-threatening cancers usually respond to aggressive chemotherapy, and indolent ones don't. As a matter of fact, the more and more chemotherapy you throw at them, the greater the chance of the patient acquiring and not dying of a secondary malignancy. Individuals with CLL uh, frequently have some degree of immunocompromise, and uh, we don't know why this is the case, but there are increased susceptibility for infections. For some individuals, you can consider a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. For considering the indolent clinical course in most individuals at the advanced age of trying to diagnosis, 
typically curative intent for treatment or curative intent is not really what is pursued for treatment. So it does exist something that's known as Richter syndrome. Richter syndrome is simply the fact that in a small percentage of patients, one CLL can progress or transform to a higher grade, more advanced, more aggressive. All my BL, BCL, which we'll learn about soon enough. That's the huge, large B cell in the Many chemotherapy regimens that are designed to treat patients with leukemia or lymphoma, they include a drug that's known as rituximab. And you should know, if you're in practice in the 21st century, you should know what rituximab is. Rituximab is a monoclonal antibody, hence the MAD at the end of the drug name. It's a monoclonal antibody that targets a particular protein that's present on the surface of almost all B cells. That's a pretty nifty target. So if you design a drug, drug, you administer a drug that targets this protein that is present on B cells and holds promise for treating individuals with B cell cancers. What is going to be a very expected side effect of rituximab? So your B cell numbers are low, but let's think about the question. So what is going to be the side effect? Susceptibility to infection. Yeah. Next one we're going to learn about is something that's known as follicular lymphoma. The name follicular simply uh, has to do with how this cancer looks like under the microscope. If you look at the top right, there are these bubbles or follicles of cancer cells that are present in the lymph node. Follicular lymphoma is one of the more common lymphomas. It is usually an indolent lymphoma. So that means it's an indolent lymphoma. There really do not exist any good curative approaches. Patients are treated with palliative chemotherapy, and the disease will pursue a waxing and waning course over many years, and eventually individuals, many of them, will succumb to this disease. The way that individuals succumb to this disease is the fact that over time, in about half of patients, this disease progresses to a high grade lymphoma, the juice large B cell lymphoma. At that point, it's really only a year or so left. So let's learn about diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Diffuse large B cell lymphoma is an aggressive lymphoma. It's one of the most common types of lymphomas, and it's also the most common CD4 pattern. Diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It is an aggressive B cell lymphoma, one of the most common. It can present either nodally or extranodally, hence its propensity to affect the oral cavities. It's aggressive without treatment of stem rapidly fatal. Most individuals achieve remission with a regimen that is known as CHOP R. So the R stands for Toximab, and CHOP stands for a handful of chemotherapeutic and steroidal agents that, uh, that are written for well. Why might a steroid be used to treat uh, a, a white blood cell cancer? If you have an autoimmune disease, what drug are you taking? A steroid. It has an inhibitory effect on white blood cells. So let's try steroids on cancer, and it works. So steroids are usually given as part of the therapeutic regimen. A plasmablastic lymphoma is a lymphoma of what cells? A plasmablast. A plasmablast are precursors to plasma cells. So as you learned about lymphocyte development and differentiation, you got to a stage where you have lymph where you have plasmablasts, right? And the plasmablast mature to plasma cells. Plasmablastic lymphoma is a white blood cell cancer of cells that genetically and functionally and physiologically are at the stage of plasmablasts. If you look at these kinds of things under a microscope, they will look like a plasma blast to you. If you guys don't do that, you can have a second if you look at it more than a second. Plasma blasting lymphoma is a highly aggressive type of lymphoma. It's usually seen in the HIV AIDS setting, sometimes in the settings of other types of immunosuppression. There's a really striking male predilection, it's usually towards the middle age. This is really the age range of untreated advanced HIV infection. And it's almost always associated with infection by Epstein Barr virus, EPV. The most common anatomic location in the whole body, the most common location is oral cavity and the jawbone, specifically.
be the man of old. This can also occur in the bathroom test and track as well, but the oral test is the most common when it comes to patients with left or left lymphoma. Our right questions for the integrated boards, but it sounds like a great kind of question to write, but all these, all these like, uh, you know, Things you can think about, you know, if it's cancer presents, what it is, what can happen, how long it is. So, the this and then, uh, these are the cell phone, are they just usually I don't know, I don't know the statistics in terms of to whom these patients present. Uh, it's definitely possible that a dentist is being this and referring to an oral surgeon on the same day for lives, like the same day for lives. Is a common kind of but these kinds of individuals may present to their primary care, or they have something that's not bad looking, they may present to an ENT surgeon. There's a lot of different ways, yeah. The last thing I'll say about plasmoblastic lymphoma is that if you have that cancer, you usually you die of that disease within the cancer. The next one I'll learn about is something called Burkitt lymphoma. Burkitt lymphoma is a lot less common in this country than it is in some other parts of the world. We're going to learn about it for a couple of reasons. Uh, Burkitt lymphoma is extremely, extremely, extremely aggressive, which also means that it does respond fairly well to aggressive cancer. It's extremely aggressive. It's a fat and it's a cancer. Here's our picture of the same bowl in the top left. And it occurs in three clinical settings. The most important clinical setting is African or endemic clinical setting. This is highly associated with Epstein Barr virus. Berkeley lymphoma has a very certain and easy to involve the manifold. It's one of the reasons why we're learning about it, another reason because it's so aggressive and it's an absence of things. Berkeley lymphoma can also occur in the HIV setting, basically in the AIDS setting, and it can also occur sporadically with the rest of the Working with Palma, way more common in Africa and other parts of the world than in the US. This was a case that was shared with me by a colleague who was on a mission trip in Africa, and I don't know the final diagnosis, we don't know the final diagnosis. We can bring some top down knowledge to this three year old female with a three month history of progressive jaw swelling, but with a clinical presentation of the community, and think that this is probably a Burkitt lymphoma. One thing I forgot to mention in the previous slide is that Burkitt lymphoma in African or endemic setting. It usually occurs in the same time. The next one that we're going to learn about is the marginal tone lymphoma. It's also known as a mult lymphoma or a mult lymphoma. And that is because this white blood cell, this white blood cell cancer frequently occurs at mucosal sites. Mucosal sites like the oropharynx, for example, or the gastrointestinal tract. Marginal tone lymphomas, or involved alt lymphomas, are really, really characterized by their association with the pre existing disease. And so, marginal tone lymphoma will affect the parotid in the context of children's syndrome. We'll learn about children's syndrome next spring, and you will again be reminded of the fact that so children's syndrome is associated with our pre existing risk for this specific white blood cell cancer. It's not just any one. Typically associated with an increased risk of marginal tone lymphomas occurring in the salivary gland. This cancer will occur in the thyroid in individuals who have national thyroiditis, and it will even occur in the stomach in individuals who have chronic inflammatory infection. We learned once upon a time about chronic inflammation being a risk factor for cancer in general, and this is really the prime example of that. The clinical course is usually indolent. And individuals are treated by surgical removal, and some individuals will even be cured if the underlying condition is treated. So, if you treat someone with H. pylori, and there should be an analyte there, if you treat someone with H. pylori with their appropriate you know, critical therapy, for example, their small tongue will make go away, which is really rather remarkable. So, when you think about some of the concepts we learned about last fall of uh, the aplasia being a genetic disease. Let's take a break here and we'll pick up at 9 o'clock.
they usually do what normal pilots do. That is they secrete an immunoglobulin or immunoglobulin fragment. This is relevant both diagnostically and clinically. Diagnostically, because the presence of abnormal immunoglobulins can be detected, and clinically, because their excess presence in the bloodstream and in peripheral tissues can cause symptomatic problems. So, plasma cells that are circulating in our blood are not clonal, right? They're not all the exact same plasma cells. But if you have a plasma cell neoplasm, if you have a plasma cell cancer, not all cancer, however large it is in the body, is derived from one plasma cell. And so that means that every single one of these cancerous plasma cells has basically the exact same DNA. Does that mean that these plasma cells will all secrete the exact same immunoglobulin if they have the exact same DNA? They will. So does that mean that in a laboratory test, and we'll just say this on the left is a laboratory test, if you have an army of identical plasma cells all secreting the exact same immunoglobulin, do you think that you might find like a really elevated spike that is right in the area of that abnormal immunoglobulin? The answer to that is yes, and this is known as an N spike, the N being one of the So this is a blood electrophoresis, and it assesses for all the proteins in the blood, so albumin and alpha and beta globulins, which are important for transport, and then gamma globulins. Immunoglobulins are gamma globulins. Right, we have all these different immunoglobulins, so typically in normal blood, the gamma globulin distribution is rather wide. You have lots of many different kinds. But in the presence of a plasma cell cancer, you basically have one specific immunoglobulin that far and away outshines the rest in terms of secretion. This monoclonal spike is because of the increased amounts of M protein. M protein is what we call the single monoclonal immunoglobulin produced by the plasma cell. Immunoglobulin light chains themselves can be produced independently. They're small in size. They can be excreted in the urine, and these are referred to as Benz Jones proteins. Sorry, I didn't know that name, Benz Jones proteins. So now that we have very quickly learned some basics about plasma cell cancers, let's learn about multiple myeloma or plasma cell myeloma. My hope is, and maybe we'll just make you go through the slides more slowly on your own time. But these couple of slides of introduction should make everything in this disease make sense. A couple of epidemiologic factors, this is the most lethal plasma cell cancer, and it has a predilection for elderly African American males. As the name would suggest, it usually presents as tumorous masses that are scattered multiply throughout the skeletal system. Clinical features are variable. And this has to do with the fact that you have cancer growing in your bone, which is what's going to affect your skeleton. It has to do with the fact that your cancer is producing a ton of immunoglobulins. And it has to do with the fact that your normal immune system is being suppressed by the really, really striking preponderance of cancerous plasma cells. So clinical features that have to do with the presence of the cancer in bone are the kind of things that you can think about. Obviously, there's going to be lytic or radiolucent lesion throughout the skeleton. There's going to be an increased risk of pathologic fractures. What's a pathologic fracture? So, pathologic fracture is a type of fracture. If you're playing basketball and you fall and you break your arm, that's a fracture because you broke your arm. But a pathologic fracture, such as a spinal cord compression, is the kind of fracture that occurs not because you did anything but simply because so much of that bone has been eaten away by some pathology that's there, that it just fractures on its own. Pathologic fractures can also occur in osteoporosis. We'll learn about osteoporosis soon enough. Multiple myeloma is characterized by too much calcium in the blood. That, may, that should make sense because the skeleton is a calcium reservoir. And as the cancer is metastasizing and growing in the bones, it is spilling all this calcium into the bloodstream. And there's going to be normal hematopoietic suppression. They will not have adequate numbers of red blood cells and so on and so forth. Because there are so many immunoglobulins that are being secreted by this cancer, because they're all the same, that's of relevance diagnostically. We've already talked about that. We can assess one's response to therapy by their presence or absence of protein. 
Ben's Jones protein, which are small enough to go into the urine to be excreted. That means that they go through the glomerular filter and they travel through the renal tubular system. Ben's Jones proteins are extremely toxic for renal tubular cells, and they're an important cause for renal damage. Therefore, in individuals with plasma cell myeloma have kidney damage. Think about those who have you have. In some patients, the, the immunoglobulins will leave the circulatory system and they will just deposit as these insoluble aggregates of tissue. It's known as amyloid. And so amyloid deposition can be noted in a periorbital location, a purpura, also known as rectum or battle sign. And the tongue is a somewhat characteristic. Characteristic does not mean con, characteristic is characteristic. It's somewhat characteristic location for amyloid deposition. This results as preponderance of abnormal immunoglobulins being produced. It suppresses the production of normal immunoglobulins as well. And so, therefore, our individuals will be increased, increased risk of recurring bacterial infections. Here's a textbook picture of someone with a huge tongue. What we call that macroglossia. This tongue is enlarged because of amyloid deposition within it. Here's a case of moral surgery. This is one or two years ago now. <coughs> and the and pan, I hope that we can look at this pan and see, you know, there's some, there's some something that's going on. You need to see of this tooth. And it's a little bit of a radiolucency. It's somewhat poorly defined. So the tooth was extracted. This was curated out. And then what we saw here, these are microscopic images. This is made with another microscope. And you see all of these different classes. Lots and lots of plasma cells. Now, plasma cells usually have physiologically a certain ratio of capital lambda. And we learned that there's going to be a 3 to 1 or a 5 to 1 ratio of capital lambda. What on earth is capital lambda refer to? It refers to the light source. And so, if these plasma cells, if every single one of these plasma cells all express lambda light chain, what does that mean? Does this mean that these are all identical plasma cells? Or does this mean that we're looking at in the top proliferation of physiological plasma cells? Good. Yeah, if these were physiologic plasma cells, we should have a sprinkling of both kappa and lambda and the SS cells. So this is an example of multiple myeloma. And this individual, after a model change of variable bones, as is typically seen in multiple myeloma. How do we treat these patients? Uh, it's difficult to treat these patients. High dose chemotherapy uh, is the way to go. If individuals can tolerate a bone marrow transplant, that is a good idea. Five year overall survival is about 50%, and survival rates depend on a whole lot of stage factors. We won't get into it. But 50% five year overall survival. On occasion, individuals will present with a solitary lesion without any other skeletal involvement or serologic. And we call that solitary plasma cytoma. Sometimes the solitary plasma cytoma will occur in the bone, as in the case of this uh, skull lesion, and sometimes it will occur in the soft tissue, as in the case of this hormone lesion. Some of these individuals will progress to multiple myeloma over the next five to ten years. Before we leave uh, plasma cell and multiple myeloma altogether, I think it's worth uh, being aware of the existence of a condition that's known as NGUS. NGUS is a monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance. Gammopathy simply refers to this finding that if you have a plasma cell cancer, you have an abnormal production of a one immunoglobulin in particular. So, monoclonal gammopathy is unknown significance. Monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance means that serologically an end spike or a monoclonal protein has been identified when an elderly patient goes in for routine blood work. But upon further workup, there are no other findings suggestive of plasma cell or multiple myeloma findings. Multiple myeloma. Patients are entirely asymptomatic, so there's absence of crab features. And you can maybe think about crab when you're thinking about the signs and symptoms of multiple myelomas. Hypercalcemia, renal insufficiency, anemia, and bone lineage. And there's no findings anywhere. Nothing in the urine, a bone marrow biopsy is negative. However, there is clearly some kind of a neoplastic proliferation of plasma cells, otherwise, we wouldn't need a very small insect. 
We call this condition MGUS. It's present in 3% of the population above age 50, and it's present in 5% of the population above age 70. That's common. That's prevalent. About 1% of individuals with MGUS a year develop multiple myeloma or perhaps some other causes. We do need to talk about amyloid very quickly. We have learned about amyloid deposition now ever so briefly when we consider the fact that immunoglobulins can be deposited in the common or in joint spaces as this amorphous, poorly degradable substance that persists. Amyloid is this proteinaceous substance that is poorly degradable. Amyloid is not caused by any one protein. Amyloid is not caused by any of them. Can be, but can be caused by about 20 other proteins which are known to have the same tendency to deposit in an insoluble fashion. They deposit in a very particular way across the data so you can see the if you're on a stage and you want to press the button in your hand. But the point being is this is a poorly degradable solution of these proteins. Amyloidosis is like this whole category of disease. Amyloid deposition can occur in a few different points. Systemically, it can occur in a localized setting, and it can occur in a familial or a hereditary setting. We won't say anything about that. For localized amyloidosis, I'll just point out to you two different anatomical sites between the heart and the tongue, where amyloid deposition is somewhat relatively common. Systemic amyloidosis frequently occurs in the setting of multiple myeloma or some other kind of disorders. We call that primary amyloid. Amyloidosis will also occur secondary to a chronic inflammatory condition, like rheumatoid arthritis. We call that secondary. Amyloidosis, for a few reasons, can also occur in the setting of hemodialysis. That is increasingly less common because of new and improved filters that are used during hemodialysis. So these are our B cell lymphomas having heart per minute in plasma cell world. Now we're going to just talk about one NK or T cell lymphoma. The point is just to know that NK and T cell lymphoma exist, to know that it's aggressive, to know that it occurs in the nasal region, and aggressive lymphomas in the nasal region can perforate the heart palate and result in intraoral clinical presentation. That's really what you need to know about this. Are you going to see one of these in your careers? You won't. You won't see one of these in your careers. You may see this on the board. And it's definitely worth, worth being aware of some of the lymphomas that occur that are not these on the board. Before we entirely wrap up lymphomas, let's talk about Hodgkin lymphoma. Hodgkin lymphoma is a specific diagnosis. It's a specific type of lymphoid neoplasm that has several unique characteristics. For starters, it has this interesting way of metastasizing from one lymph node to the next one. It almost goes like, you know, like the mailman going down the street. The other thing that's interesting about Hodgkin lymphoma is that the actual wound by the actual enlarged lymph node that an adolescent male, for example, may be infected, almost all of that enlargement is just normal inflammation. The cancer cells, you can see these so called allo eyes, right? In there. So these are the tumor cells. And these tumor cells, these cancer cells, have such a remarkable ability to recruit normal inflammatory cells that even though the cancerous cells account for like 1, 2, or like 5% of the tissue, even though they account for 1 or 2% of the tissue, they still recruit so much of the inflammation here that really significant clinical presentation. The clinical presentation, the microscopic presentation, is so characteristic that it is the base for our historical way of classifying the homes. So historically, and we still use this nowadays, and more frequently than now, like, we talk about Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Hodgkin lymphoma is a specific disease. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is basically every other lymphoma in the name. So if you hear on the news that someone dies of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, you go, okay, that's not. That doesn't come in 200 lymphomas. So Hodgkin lymphoma, the most common cancer in teenagers, is a second peak after treatment as well. It usually presents painless lymphadenopathy that may or may not have decent. 
Hodgkin lymphoma is frequently curable with chemo radiation, even stage 4 disease and the 5 years survival of The lymphomas that we've covered have just been a few of all of the lymphomas that exist. And the reason why we covered the ones that we did is either because they're common in the population, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, CLL, follicular lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, marginal cell lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, and multiple myeloma, all of which we learned about, make up over 90% of the lymphoma. So if you know these well, you have 90% of this covered. And we learned about a few other ones like black and black very specific for the cancer. This is a hairy cell leukemia. It's one of the other things we're going to talk about. You can maybe guess how it's not the name, hairy cell leukemia. So let's learn next about myeloidemia. Myeloidemiaplasms generally present with leukemias, and they present clinically with symptoms that are related to altered hematopoiesis. Myeloidemiaplasms come in three flavors. There's acute myeloid leukemia, or AML, we learned about ALL, now we're going to learn about AML, effects of adults and elderly. These so called myelodysplastic syndromes and myelodysplastic disorders. We're only going to spend a minimal amount of time on these. These are precursor lesions to AML, and the significance of one's myelodysplastic syndrome or myeloproliferative disorder is the fact that this individual is at increased risk of developing AML. So what is AML? AML, or acute myeloid leukemia, is a somewhat common leukemia. It has an increasing incidence throughout life. It peaks in about the peak and correlates up to incidence around the age of 60. AML is characterized by cancer of, or is a cancer of hematopoietic progenitors. And cancer of progenitor cells ultimately impedes myeloid differentiation. Immature myeloid blasts accumulate in the marrow. And as a result, marrow failure occurs, and there are symptoms that are related to trilineage and cytopenia. Trilineage, right? Mania, trauma, cytopenia, and cytopenia. There are many different kinds of AML. This is an outdated classification. We're just going to learn about the general category of disease. We're not going to learn about any specific AML diagnosis. Keep in mind that it's quite heterogeneous. We're learning about the pattern. We're not learning about specific AML. Some of the many kinds of AML that exist are listed here, and that's all we'll say about that. AML, as a matter of fact, is particularly this variant, the two prime or myelosleepopenia. AML has something of a predilection to affect the gingiva. Again, is this common? No. Is it characteristic? Yes. And not some kind of tendency to affect the gingiva or the skin. Like the skin is called the leukemia cutis. And so there are certain presentations that may be increased risk of bleeding or increased tendency of bleeding that can all occur. AML is difficult to treat. An individual who has AML is probably going to die of that disease. Many patients do achieve remission, but very few remain disease free after five years. So recurrences are very, very common. The best treatment approach for individuals who can stand it is to absolutely bombard their existing hematopoietic uh, system, including inclusive of those genetically malignant cells, and then getting them into the bone marrow. So that is AML, really, in a nutshell. Myelodysplastic syndromes are significant for carrying a variable risk of transformation to AML. There are a handful of different myelodysplastic syndromes, and I think we'll talk about, but we'll talk about some of them. We'll talk about a couple of myelodysplastic There's a handful of different myelodysplastic syndromes. Their significance lies in being precursors to AML, which is a rather deadly disease. Myelodysplastic syndromes are characterized by maturation defects with ineffective hematopoiesis. So these defective cells are not adequately maturing into their form elements, but these defective cells, fortunately, they have not yet acquired the capability to proliferate and control. Once they acquire that capability, then AML will develop, and that's why this is a precursor of mutant to AML. NBS can be primary or it can be secondary to drug or radiation therapy. NBS usually occurs in elderly. I talk about how AML increases in incidence of age. 
so does NDX. Treatment option options are limited. No matter what extent some transplants can be considered, but that carries a risk that you don't know if the patient's going to get AML, so maybe it's not necessary. You don't want to give them too much chemo or radiation because you don't want to put them at increased risk of developing secondary malignancies like the AML. And there's also a risk of doing watchful waiting because some percentage of these individuals do progress to AML. Myeloproliferative disorders are also precursor lesions to AML, but they're kind of, they're also precursor lesions to AML, but they're kind of the opposite of NDX. So NDX is like these weird cells that do not hyperproliferate. Myeloproliferative disorders are normal cells that are hyperproliferative, and they're just waiting to acquire a secondary defect in 10 years. So we learned a week or two ago about polycythemia vera and how this is some condition that just results in tons and tons of red blood cells being released into the bloodstream. One of the small bullet points on that slide should have read that there's an increased risk for AML because this cell is producing lots and lots of red blood cells, way more than it should be producing lots of people. All that's left for this cell to truly become malignant is for it to acquire some other characteristic that results in it giving off bad autoimmune. So there are many different myeloproliferative disorders, and I think we'll talk about a couple. We'll talk about polycythemia vera, we'll talk about CML, which is a very important thing. Again, the significance of myeloproliferative disorders is in their risk of progression for the leukemia. Polycythemia vera is an increase in red blood cells, granulocytes, and platelets. This results in an increased blood volume, this causes abnormal blood flow. So with abnormal blood flow, there's an increased risk of what? Thrombo and bone disease, we learned about that last week. And many patients will come to attention because of something like a DVT. There can be other clinical symptoms that are associated with abnormal blood flow. Many of these individuals do well with therapeutic philosophy, which is basically completely unknown. But without treatment, individuals will die from abnormal bleeding or from thrombo and bone Give me a few minutes to answer this. I think I'm going to run it.